Welcome everybody. I'm Elizabeth Thompson. I'm the producer of the Sustainability Laboratories conversation series and I want to welcome you all and thank you so much for joining us today from all over the world. I just wanted to contextualize this series as a whole. We launched it as a means for the Sustainability Lab to contribute to the urgent need to develop new models and approaches to addressing the interrelated sustainability crises affecting the world today. And you'll see that the speakers who have joined us for this series are, are tackling um, the, the, the spectrum um, from a global systems perspective of these enormous challenges. Um, and today we'll focus on sustainability in the developing world with the renowned Indian environmentalist, Dr. Ashok Kosla. Uh, we will be hearing from Dr. Kosla about his background and professional career during the conversation with Michael. So I, I will only just say here by way of introduction that he is a true pioneer in the realm of sustainable development, defining and framing the issues relating to development from a holistic perspective from the very early early days um, and we could not be more honored or delighted that he has joined us here today. Thank you so much, Ashok. I, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, but before we get started, um, we want to uh, share with you a very short, about two minute long um, video about the Sustainability Lab. Then we'll come back with Michael and Ashok and um, uh, start the conversation. Our planet is in distress. Persistent, insensitive human activities now threaten every vital component of the biosphere, including the well-being of our own species. We are faced with a choice, continuous deterioration or a commitment to sustainability. Transitioning from the current state of affairs to a sustainable basis is an unprecedented challenge. There is no blueprint to guide us. We need bold experimentation with new ways of thinking and acting. This is why we established the Sustainability Laboratory, a global platform for sustainability innovations, a catalyst inspiring positive change. In our development projects, we work collaboratively with communities to bring about sustainability-related transformations. In our education initiatives, we help train future leaders to tackle the urgent sustainability issues facing the planet. And in our research projects, we foster groundbreaking innovations in technology. This is the Sustainability Laboratory aiming to expand prospects and produce positive, life-affirming impacts on people and ecosystems in all parts of the world, joining with others to ensure a transition to a sustainable future. Hi, Michael. How are you? Good. So great to see you and so great to have you with us. Watching your, your video just now reminded me that it's almost identical to all the work that we do in my organization. Well, well we are, we are uh, <laughs> I'd say, brothers in arm in a sense. It's true. Although you are way ahead in many ways. So we have so much to talk about today, uh, but we wanted to actually start with you and actually give the audience a sense of uh, becoming Ashok Koshla. Uh, what are milestones in your personal trajectory, uh, inspirations, shaping events, uh, mentors, and how do you started with physics and ended up with the environment and poverty? So I'll let you start with that. I'm not really used to talking about myself that much. So let me just, try to tell you uh, within a broader context 
of what um, people like you and I have been seeking in our lives, which is to be practitioners, but to be thoughtful practitioners. What is it that we do and, or what, and why, we, why we actually go about doing it? And uh, a reflective practitioner should we be, what, what is it that we should be doing, not just what we are doing? And the roles and responsibilities of a professional in delivering decent lives uh, is actually now more and more important in a rapidly developing but highly unfair and resource depleting world. Uh, we want to be good ancestors. We want to leave behind a world with better knowledge and culture and social values, and of course, that capital. And yet we find ourselves in enormous amount of crisis uh, uh, points. Uh, things like rampant poverty, things like growing, rapidly growing population, uh, pollution rampant all over the world, climate uh, crises, biodiversity and species extinction at rates never seen in, in literally uh, hundreds of millions of years, pandemics, resource depletion, so social breakdown, financial breakdown. And you know, all of this essentially is a big disease. It's not simply running out of fuel and running out of resources. Uh, it's about a major breakdown in what we do. In my country, which has been independent of uh, after um, decolonization for 75 years, uh, we have grown from zero to 177 billionaires. Believe it or not, 40 of them were added in the last month, 12 months uh, of uh, COVID lockdowns. Uh, and we have 300 million people, more or less the size of the US, uh, which is a flourishing middle class. It's uh, no mean achievement. But at the same time, we have 300 plus million hungry and malnourished. We've got 400 million people who can't read or write or do even simple arithmetic. We have 700 million people who are essentially outside the mainstream economy. Our top soils and waters are depleting rapidly. Uh, we had once upon a time lush forests and rivers and wetlands, a place where, you know, Christopher Columbus and Vasco da Gama, they were all looking for the riches of, of uh, the subcontinent. And what, we, what do we have? We have deserts growing at something like 10,000 square kilometers a year. My own journey started uh, very early um, in uh, the early to, during the war. Uh, I was born in North India, I was born in Lahore in Punjab uh, state of uh, Northern India. Uh, I was in a privileged family. We used to spend half our life in, in the plains during the winter and uh, in, the, in the hills in Sirinagar, Kashmir in the summers. Uh, but in 1947, India broke up into several countries and frankly, we became refugees uh, and ended up in, in a camp in New Delhi in 1948. Uh, we were privileged refugees. My father became a diplomat. He had been a professor before. And um, the rest of the next uh, 20 odd years, my brother and I and followed our parents in uh, Europe, in, the, uh, in England, and we went to college in England, in Cambridge. I went to Harvard University for my PhD. So we were not exactly normal refugees. We had pretty good uh, lives, but the experience of being a refugee is, is an experience and you don't really forget that. Uh, I recall the walk that we had to make uh, for about eight or nine days to get to safety when our um, city was attacked. Uh, at Harvard University, I was ostensibly doing a PhD in physics uh, but I was really more of an excuse because although I loved physics, I knew that one day I would have to go back to India. I would want to go back to India and I would not be able to afford the kind of science that I could afford to do uh, in the US. I used to spend my summers and, and evenings uh, doing businesses. I actually did door to door selling of encyclopedias for several years. Uh, and made a lot of money and actually probably learned more in that particular job than I did in any other single place. Uh, uh, I came back from uh, Harvard at the end of my PhD at the age of 31. And my professor, about whom I will tell you a little bit later, uh, had written to the prime minister, who was Mrs. Indira Gandhi, 
um, that I was coming home and that she should try and find me a job. And she did. She offered me the job of setting up the agency for the environment, the government agency, which later became a ministry. I did that. I did that for five years. It was certainly the most powerful job that I can ever imagine. I could virtually do anything I wanted. I could stop big industries. I could stop roads from being set up. I could stop, I could stop anything. Uh, but I realized very quickly that that's not what environment was about. The environment was about making people's lives better and you had to have a mixture. And that is in a sense, the experience that led to the concept of sustainable development. Those five years were very, very important uh, in my own thinking and in by being able to share that thinking with others. And I'll come to that again later too. In the government of India, I uh, was uh, everywhere. I had um, the ability to project the idea that I uh, was representing the prime minister who was the minister of environment. And that gave me a pretty strong uh, platform to work from. I did that for five years. Then I was persuaded by Maurice Strong, who had set up UNEP in Nairobi, uh, to join UNEP. And I did that. And after five more years, I decided that I had to do what I was really born to do, which was to set up a social enterprise called Development Alternatives. It was probably the first, it was the first social enterprise in the world, uh, and a social enterprise at that time, which I called a development venture, was an organization that was basically a not-for-profit, but working like a business. And uh, we were told by everybody that you can't do such a thing, but we did, and we're still here. So the question really is, can we as professionals in whom society has invested so heavily uh, be better ancestors for future generations? And my own professional choices were made based on experience, of course, and the opportunities that came up. Um, but I had to choose between science, where I'd grown up to think that a Nobel Prize was more important than anything else, uh, and choosing India. And my choice was uh, India, partly because of a sense of outrage at the way things were in the world, and partly because my DNA made me more or less forced me uh, to be an Indian. Uh, my long journey seeking an answer and some of the mentors who inspired the questions that you asked me to talk a little bit about made, made um, uh, a, a, a very strong impression on me. Uh, my teachers included John Kendrew, who got a Nobel Prize for deciphering the myoglobin molecule, Norman Ramsey, who got a Nobel Prize in 1989 for uh, inventing the atomic clock. And he, by the way, was one of the few, if not the only, Nobel Prize winner who actually shared uh, a part of his Nobel Prize with his graduate students. I actually got $1,000 uh, of the 1989 um, Nobel Prize. And then there was, of course, Roger Revell. Now, Roger was truly a giant who had led the Scripps Institute in La Jolla for 30 odd years, had been uh, President Kennedy's science advisor. And when I met him, he was professor of environment and population at Harvard. And he and I taught the first course, uh, a university course on, uh, on the environment. In fact, uh, Al Gore, Benazir Bhutto, many people were students in that course. And it was truly a uh, remarkable and pioneering course. And then there was Maurice Strong. Now, this was an extraordinary human being who uh, I can tell, talk about for an hour, uh, who probably, in my opinion, uh, made greater contribution to the UN and to the world than virtually anybody in the 20th century. He was truly a magnificent human being who grew up in the depression in Canada with virtually nothing to eat for, for months on end and made himself into uh, a truly gigantic personality uh, uh, on, the, on the international level. And then of course there was uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi who was my boss and, and, and quite inspiring, and Mustafa Tolba, uh, the successor of Maurice Strong at UNEP, who can be credited with having forced the world to sign the conventions on, on, on um, ozone, on uh, climate change, on biodiversity, and on uh, desertification. Four major conventions, I think, can be put squarely at his feet as being a person who did a huge amount of work. And then of course, 
uh, it's not a cliche, uh, my father. My father was truly a, a, a huge, hugely important person in my life. And I think the day I gave up my uh, very, very remunerative job, tax-free job in the UN and came back to virtually no pay at all to set up my organization was probably the proudest day in his life. He just thought that was uh, really something important. And he gave me a lot of support uh, uh, doing that. So after Harvard University and um, learning how to do these things, I came back to set up development alternatives and development alternatives, I will talk a little bit about later, gave me an opportunity to take very active role in various international organizations. I became the president of the Club of Rome and of IUCN and of the chair of the International Resource Panel, which does for resources what IPCC does for climate. Uh, I have been very privileged to be at the right place at the right time. I was uh, one of the small group of people who wrote the World Conservation Strategy, where the term sustainable development was first published on the 5th of March in 1980. I was um, a special advisor to Mrs. Brunton for uh, the World Commission on Environment and Development and contributed to the writing of our common future. I was at the Rio Earth Summit as the chairman of the NGOs and brought 40, more than 40,000 NGOs from all over the world to uh, take part in the Earth Summit and so on. So I was really very privileged to be around uh, at the right time, as I say. Uh, the uh, growth of the concepts uh, all the way from limits to growth in 1972, uh, through our common future, through the MDGs in 2000, through the various other things uh, uh, at, the, um, at the SDG level uh, and the Rio Plus 20, um, I was fortunate enough to be a, a major uh, player in, in, in all these. So the question really is our dilemma. But at this point, I think I would really stop for a second and say um, to Michael, um, that's where I come yeah, from. Ashok, what, what a tremendous trajectory. And of course, uh, it will be reflected in everything that you'll tell us later on. But uh, a couple of small, uh, 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 not very profound comment. Indira Gandhi, uh, obviously she had the vision to start one of the first Ministry of Environments in developing world. I don't know, I don't know if you are aware, but uh, uh, my own uh, teacher and mentor, Buckminster Fuller, as you know, was invited by Indira to come to India to give the narrow memorial lecture at the time, and also then to try and work out a whole new global air transport system starting from India. So uh, I, I, she obviously must have been a lady of great vision. I wonder if you can uh, add something to that. Yeah, she was not only visionary, she had a sense of um, her place in history. She was, she was always thinking about what kind of a legacy uh, she would be leaving behind, how the history books would treat her. She really was um, a person who uh, thought a little bit more than what the day-to-day -day decisions a, a normal politician has to make. And uh, yes, you're absolutely right. She was um, uh, very much into bringing some of the, the brightest and the, and, the, and, the, and the most creative people from all over the world, from the arts, from music, from science, from philosophy, um, she held a kind of a, a Camelot. It was a court uh, which in, invited and was listening to some of the best and the brightest. And uh, so in, another great lady that both of us know very well, Elizabeth Dudswell, who preceded Tolba in, in yes. UNIT, uh, actually uh, 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 sends her regard. She was sorry she couldn't join us today, Thank but you. she will be sure to watch the the uh, yeah. the. the, the recording when it's available. So hello from Liz. Uh, now, it, when you summarize the issues in, in India, uh, you, you, you really put a, a finger in what is a broader dilemma facing the world. And that's what we'll be uh, looking at next. Yeah, I would like really just to share with you a few things about how, uh, what, what should we be doing? And I, I, going beyond the reflective practitioner, what do reflective institutions think about? 
How do they think? The primary responsibility of a social institution really is the three Ps, people, prosperity, and the planet. They, those are the three big issues that have to be dealt with by any institution today. And the way they have to deal with them is the three E's, efficiency and equity and environment. These are the three major issues that we need to deal with. And my whole uh, thesis and what I would like to share with you this evening, uh, morning your time, uh, is um, these two sets of three the triads, which are very important. Efficiency, as you can see, can be in the fa factory, it's in the village, it's in the home, it's at work. Efficiency means just getting more for less in many ways. But also there's the whole question of equity. Here is a girl with two brothers, you know, you can see the other one in her lap, uh, asking, you know, what uh, has the world done for me? And she's uh, quite right to ask because um, uh, there isn't very much that the world has done for her. And then there is the ecological uh, dimension, which is the ecological footprint, which you all know about, and I don't want to explain it all, but basically it's the share of the world's uh, resource base that each one of us shares. And it has been growing. This uh, uh, footprint, which used to be uh, at the time of, uh, of uh, the Second World War, uh, around 0.5 is now close, getting close to 2. 0.5, what we used to use in the, in the early 40s uh, was half of what we, we were entitled to, and, and now we're using twice as much. And really, that's a major issue. And one of the big issues of having a big footprint is a heavy boot print. A boot print means that you've got really the few people in power uh, essentially sweeping away the rest of us uh, like flies. And the economic and the social and the political impact of a, an ecological footprint are huge because they essentially lead to kinds of societies that none of us want to have. Already in 1972, the Club of Rome's book, uh, Limits to Growth, which really made a, a huge impact. So uh, it showed in 1972 that if we continued to develop the world's resources and people's uh, lives the way we were, uh, by the year 20, 20, 2080 or so, uh, things would start decaying, they would start collapsing. And uh, we haven't got to 2080 yet, but uh, all the studies that have been conducted show that we are very much on track uh, along the lines that it was, uh, was suggested at that time. I wouldn't call it a prediction, but it's uh, what it was. So our primary purpose now has to be to tunnel somehow, tunnel through the Kuznets curve uh, of going from a, a poor and um, dirty uh, uh, society, economy, through, um, through a poor and clean society, through a poor, uh, a sort of a medium and rich, dirty to a rich and, and clean society, which we're not doing very well at the moment. The outcomes depend really on all of us, on the governments, on business, on civil society, and on individual citizens. The basis of these decisions are where the whole problem lies. We now need uh, to take care of some of the problems that I was talking about uh, with longer time horizons, with uh, full cost accounting, with promoting diversity and resilience, uh, by conserving resources, by nurturing uh, particularly things like fulfillment and happiness and, and ensuring the participation of all the people who get affected by those decisions. Environmental concepts of efficiency and productivity and conservation and dematerialization become extremely important in our management of resources. And at the moment, these are not, these are not top of mind. These are not number one priorities with anyone. Social concepts of equity and social justice, inclusion, participation, as I said, and, and transparency are fundamentally important for eradicating poverty. And there are many different kinds of policy interventions that governments and businesses and civil society can take, uh, can, can adopt. Um, I think I'd like really to jump straight into what the global problematic is. Um, Michael, if I may just continue. Yes, just go straight ahead. Um, all of us know what basic, how very sick our, our planet is. Uh, some of us don't realize that uh, during our lifetime, during the last 20, 30 years even, uh, 
every few years, a new headline come, turns up. Uh, we have the 2080 dilemma of, uh, of equity, inequity in the world. We have the climate issues. We have ecosystems. All of these are life-threatening for the planet. And what worries people like Michael and me is the surprise ones, the ones that haven't turned up yet. What is to say that these are the only problems we've got? In another five years, the things in our headlines and, and, and being, uh, bringing uh, uh, heads of state to, uh, to summits, uh, international summits, will be maybe completely different because every few years, we're just adding more and more huge problems. And we call this the squeeze on humanity. And it's a very important uh, concept that we've got to keep in mind that you have to design your development in such a way that not only do you not create new problems, but that you're resilient to the ones that do turn up. And you can see that over the last 200 odd years, technology and economic development have done enormous good for improving the lives of people. Uh, there is uh, an enormous amount of wealth being created. Uh, we sometimes call it affluenza because it has a little bit of a disease element to it. Uh, here is a picture taken uh, quite far back in 1994 uh, by Peter Denzel. Uh, and, and you can see one family, he persuaded them to bring all their belongings outside. And uh, they lived pretty well then. And now today, they have probably twice as much uh, in their homes. Um, this is uh, in um, 2005, about 15 years ago. He uh, got this family in Europe to put out all the food that they eat in one week. And you can see that um, they're pretty well fed. In fact, 40% uh, of it is going to be wasted because uh, uh, if they ate all of it, they would all be in hospital anyway. Uh, so this is a, uh, an example of the kind of wasteful uh, life that we are leading. We have basically mastered the universe. Humanity is now in charge of every, everything that nature has. And we have a lot of people, particularly in the ones that are circled here, who consume a great deal of the world's resources. The less than 20% of the people uh, use up well over 80, 85% uh, of the resources of the world. So that is the consumption society. And you can see some of its impacts. Uh, it's a nonsense society. You dig out everything from the ground, you put it all over here, you uh, basically massacre the countryside, and then you end up in the city dump. Uh, and then you're locked in for decades, even centuries, uh, into these technologies, which prevent you from ever being able to change things again. There's uh, mining, there's uh, poisoning, uh, the atmosphere, uh, and you know economists call this externalizing the costs, but actually it's just killing off people, uh, poisoning the countryside, uh, changing the climate, uh, creating forest fires, uh, and every now and then more and more unusual events keep taking place. This is, uh, unfortunately shows that the Kuznets curve is way, way off. Uh, we are going on in using more and more uh, resources. We call it the metabolic rate, the physical uh, metabolic rate of each society. As, as it becomes richer, uh, uh, it uses more and more. The ones below the red line are a little more efficient or a little less greedy. The ones above the uh, red line are ones that are using more than their fair share, even at the level of economic development that they have. And you see the basic thing is that we're going to end up with destroying all our uh, resources. This is a picture of an area of central India where my organization works a lot. Uh, 50 years ago, this was a lush, very dense teak and bamboo forest. Uh, the local people used to claim they couldn't penetrate it and it was filled with uh, wildlife and fauna and tigers and everything else. Today, this is what it looks like. And our uh, global deserts are growing at something like 50,000 square kilometers a year. This is a rosy periwinkle. Without it, you wouldn't have a cure for childhood leukemia. And frankly, the little bit of rosy periwinkle left in Madagascar is not going to be there for much longer. And then there are species, look at this, Bluefin tuna, one of the mightiest creations uh, uh, of nature, uh, 
They were paid literally one million dollars for this uh, one fish uh, about um, two years ago. Can you imagine um, a, a, a fish costing that much? Why? Because it's scarce, because we've killed it off. Anytime somebody sees a bluefin tuna, it's done, it's finished. And um, at the moment, you can see the demand has gone up to infinity, the prices have gone up to infinity, and the supply is zero. Sand, one of the most common materials is now so scarce that uh, Singapore, Dubai, a large part of India, are unable to find enough sand to, to meet their construction needs. Uh, it's a huge mafia business now in many, many countries, including mine. So here is your uh, UN Human Development Report uh, cover of 1991, the first human development report published. And what it said was that uh, the richest fifth of uh, the population of the world uh, has an income of about 85%. Uh, of the income of the world. So this is the old 85, 80, 20 rule. The top 85% gets virtually everything and the bottom half get virtually nothing. This is uh, what it was like in 1991. Uh, 18, what is it? Seven, 16 years later in 2007, that champagne glass had become a bar stool. Within 16 years, this GDP distribution had just gone completely out of whack. Then after that, we've never talked about 2080. We talk about 1%. We talk about, in some countries, we talk about 0.1%. And that's the people who basically have cornered everything. And so this affluenza, this overconsumption is a very, very large part of our dilemma. Uh, this is just to show you in India, I talked about it a little earlier, uh, the growth of millionaires in India has been phenomenal. It's, a, it's an explanation, it's a hockey stick. Um, this was in 1960, and look at what we're doing now. We're actually talking about more than half a million uh, dollar millionaires. And so even poor countries now have middle classes who are as living as well as anywhere in uh, Europe or North America. We call them biosphere people because they can access things from all over the biosphere. Then we will come to the other side of the coin. So may I stop, uh, Michael, and let you um, react to what I'm saying? Do you think it makes sense what I'm talking about? Yeah, of course it makes sense, but I, I, you know, I sometimes wonder whether it's correct to list those items that you have listed there as problems. Uh, I like to see them as symptoms. They are symptoms of a deeper malaise. Uh, they are produced by something else. It's not the problem that is the problem. It's really what produces the problem that we should right. focus on. And You're that's right. we can talk about it a little later on. Uh, but uh, this is where the underlying structures, the financial markets, yeah. the governance, well, and all of those kind of things. But well, let's, well, switch, only... uh, let's switch. Before we get into that, we won't forget that. But let's look at the other side and what characterizes the, uh, the developing world. Uh, yeah. in relation to those issues and dilemmas? Well, a large part of Latin America, Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia is really a subsistence economy. As I say, there are people there living as well as anywhere, and you can see them here in the pictures, but 80% um, of, the, of the third world, of the, of the global south, is uh, living in a very close to survival and subsistence life. This is a, a woman uh, whose uh, picture I took a long time ago where we work. I, I think her life has improved since then, but it, it represents the other disease, which we call povertitis. And every time I see this picture, I wonder how many people uh, are, are, uh, have had the capability of this, the potential of being a Marie Curie or a Maria Callas and who never had a chance to fulfill themselves. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there are in every country literally hundreds and thousands of people who could be great scientists, great dancers, great musicians, and they never had a chance. And this is uh, an example. I mean, 300 million people around the world don't have, um, in India, and about a billion people around the world have no clean drinking water. Look at the way they have to carry it every day. 
no fiber, no cooking fuel. Uh, this is a family in India in 1994, also taken by Peter Menzel, um, who uh, have brought all their food for the week out in this thing. This is what I took in the area that we work in. And uh, this is more recent, as you can see. And uh, basically, um, that's what a family of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people can get uh, during the course of a week. Affluenza and povertitis, they lead to diseases. Uh, povertitis leads to despair. And we have to recognize that COVID-19 did not really break the system. It just exposed a totally broken system, not in, only in my country, but around the world. And poverty and environment cause refugees. Literally millions of people leave their homes every year looking for ways to uh, make a better life. Refugees from hunger and extreme poverty, refugees from economic breakdown, refugees from development projects, from dams, from uh, airports, etc. refugees from natural disasters, refugees from ecosystem destruction, and now more and more, probably going to be in the tens, if not hundreds of millions, refugees from things like climate impacts. And this is the other side of the uh, world, the under consumers, the people who do not have enough to have not only not a decent life, but the 50% of the people in this world who have are forced to have large families, have more babies, because that's the basic uh, consequence of extreme poverty. So we now need to look at these people. These are the ecosystem people. They can only live off what's available nearby. They're not able to get anything from beyond their village or maybe their little district. And here you see the graph. I showed you the millionaires, uh, which was in the thousands. Uh, um, the red line uh, is in the millions. And that is the line of hunger and malnourishment. So you can see that this is in my country, that despite all that incredible development, and India certainly has made major strides to remove poverty, you still, because of population growth, end up by uh, having a huge number of people who are left behind. In other words, the world and India are two worlds. Uh, in India, we call them India and Bharat. Bharat is the Hindi name for India. And essentially, there are two different populations living in the same place in the same time, one with privilege and plenty, and the other with poverty and pollution. And these are very, very, uh, the direct results of what M Michael interrupted me to say, which is, uh, those were the symptoms I was talking about, and I'm sorry I used the wrong word problem. Uh, and now these are the causes. The causes are that we've chosen a neoliberal economic system based on a neoclassical economics theory, which is uh, places uh, growth and uh, things like GDP and prices and earnings at the very top, and does not give any credence to the real things that make life worth living. More foreign direct investment, higher um, stock market indexes, growth rates up, rising foreign portfolios, hit and run resources. Uh, this is all about how economics and econo economists have basically designed our lives. And when you ask them, what about the future? Their answer is, what did the future do for us? Uh, if you ask them, what, what are you doing to nature? They don't count, it's an externality. Uh, if you ask them, what about happiness? They say, well, that's not monetizable. You can't count that, and therefore it doesn't fit into our theories. And of course, community, the ultimate resource of all. So the liberal, neoliberal policies are to give incentives, high, higher efficiencies, higher business uh, operations, less regulation, global markets, austerity, of course, for the poor. So everything is about more things, more consumption, and hit and run on resources. So you're absolutely right, Michael. This is basically uh, the cause in many ways. And there are deeper causes, greed, and uh, varieties of things you could also call psychological causes underlying these. But these are, these are the reasons why 
our policies are leading to dead end outcomes. Uh, this is the house of a billionaire in, in the Caribbean. And um, they're the only people who are going to be able to live on this planet. It's only going to be fit for the very, very rich. Uh, our income distribution now, as I say, is um, totally lopsided. And here you have your uh, top of the bar stool, affluenza over consumption. Here you have the bottom of the stool, which is about to collapse, which is poverty and underconsumption. And this extreme disparity is not only morally unacceptable, in, unjust and, and unfair, uh, but it's, its manifestations in the political economy, as Michael was saying, are societal diseases from these economic choices and structural dysfunction uh, of political systems, which are now becoming more and more authoritarian and, and colonial-like within their own countries. The breakdown of the planetary life support systems, including climate and, and species extinction, are just symptoms, really, manifestations of this broken down political economy. So the fundamentals have to be now uh, changed. Uh, we, stop, we must stop giving primacy to capital over labor, over nature, over well-being. We have to uh, really uh, you know, give equal uh, primacy to resources as to finance, to people as to, as to money. Uh, we have to rely much less on private capital accumulation and much more on, on common property. Uh, we have to accept, you know, uh, much less uh, in the way of disparity and, uh, and extreme poverty. Now, these are all things that it's easy to say, but our current economic systems just do not uh, agree with them. And in fact, if you talk to an economist, he will say, or she, it's usually a he, because they, they believe in Adam Smith, all completely mis, uh, misreading Adam Smith, uh, that preaches greed is good, the invisible hand. It's actually a very visible fist that we're dealing with, the boot that I was talking about earlier. So we need better models, and the models are about sustainability. Sustainable it lives... Like Yes, sorry. Sorry, right. sorry, if I can interrupt for a minute. It, it yeah. looks like there is a very interesting paradox there. Uh, on the one hand, extreme poverty is locked in a vicious circle of consuming all local resources and destroying local environments. Yeah. And on the other, it, 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 in parallel, extreme wealth is also <laughs> creating all this damage and everything. So both those extreme, poverty and extreme affluence, seem to be both uh, spiritually and physically uh, completely uh, uh, um, making well, our, our planet poorer. You're right. And it, it's actually kind of an irony, really. I mean, it's uh, very, very strange that we don't recognize how bad it is. So the, the future, as I said, lies in the three E's and the three P's. And we now need an income distribution which looks more like a glass of beer than it does a champagne glass or a bar stool. And that's what all these uh, SDGs and the goals that we're trying to set up, uh, try to bring together the three major dimensions, the people dimension, the planet dimension, and the prosperity dimension. Of course, you've got to have improved lives. Of course, you've got to have a better economy. Everybody should be better off. But the point is, it should be better, uh, more equal, and, and, and more uh, uh, in harmony with the, the natures of, of nature's constraints. So it's all about decoupling. It's, sorry, my, my mouse is not behaving. Um, it's uh, about bringing together, the, uh, defining the goals of society. Uh, we need not just efficiency, but we need also sufficiency. We need desirability, but we also need acceptability. Now, sufficiency is a very complex term. It means two separate things. The word in English, actually has two opposite meanings. One is the ceiling, the most, it is a sufficient, you have sufficient, you need no more uh, to lead a good life. But sufficiency also means adequacy. Adequacy, you must have at least a certain basic amount in order to have sufficiently good life. So we need to recognize that there are both floors and ceilings and our current economies don't recognize uh, the existence of those. Um, the current toolkits are 
innovation through um, resource productivity, through innovation, resource reduction, through substitution, and resource conservation through behavior change, which I told you about a little while ago, but miniaturization, durability, um, uh, sharing of underutilized assets, and so on. We talk a lot about the circular economy, but, but folks, the circular economy is not always what you think it is. Here is a circular economy, which is totally destructive. This is a vicious cycle. So we've got to differentiate between what a circular economy is and what it isn't. This circular economy is a poverty trap. You are in a circle forever because you, 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 you go out there, you destroy the resources, there are no markets, you have very little income, you have more babies, you've got fewer markets, you got, it's a circle, but it's a bad circle. And the question is, how do we convert from this circle to the virtuous circle and the one that we talk about uh, today, the circular economy, which uses things like waste recycling, urban mining, and so on, industrial ecology. Uh, these are the things that basically uh, make it possible to imagine a world in which uh, we are much better, um, much better uh, off uh, because we are we, we're using our resources in a much more sensible way. This is a very important uh, diagram, and I won't be able to go into it in detail because it takes time. But what it does is to show you the rucksacks and the operational and the infrastructure uh, costs in terms of materials and energy of different forms of transport. And you can see that actually the most, the most ecologically and environmentally and economically viable form of transport is a blimp, is lighter than aircraft, and it's hardly being used at all. And it turns out to be something that I believe in another 15, 20 years will be a major, major uh, form of transport. Uh, <clears throat> our future technologies are going to be based on reducing and using wastes. And I believe that the alternatives here are the ones that we've got to, uh, to create. And um, the changes that we need are the ones that I was talking about earlier, long, long term over short term, uh, complexity, um, resource limits, and recognizing the need for a well being economy. The value systems will be totally different from those of the uh, economics profession today. Lifestyles have to change, consumption patterns have to change, and the policies will have to be very different based on local governance, um, more or less like what you said just now, Mike, bringing them all uh, into local markets and developing infrastructure decision systems and information systems that are, that are uh, uh, good for local people. Um, what I'm going to try and do now in the few minutes I have left is to um, tell you a little bit about the organization I set up 40 years ago and the kind of work we do. And before that, I'm going to uh, ask Michael if I'm generally on the right track. You are totally on the right track. And uh, I would say let, let's continue with the next segment and then we'll pose for some more uh, conversation. Okay. Uh, development alternatives were set up um, in 1982 um, as a grant from UNEP, believe it or not. It was Mr. Dr. Mustafa Tolba who basically gave me a going away present, said this is one of the most important ideas that he had seen and he wanted to support it and UNEP gave me a grant. And that grant was uh, very important in enabling me to set up uh, together with the incredible support I got from my father uh, in the way of um, moral and financial support uh, to set up this organization. This is our headquarters today. And the reason I show you this picture is that it's a it's a 15 year old building and it, it's, it looks pretty well as good as new. Um, it's a very elegant building. It's probably one of the most creative, uh, how would you say, creation, creativity, create, creativity supporting buildings. The, the, my colleagues in there really are amazingly um, encouraged to do uh, great work. The reason that I show you this building is it's symbolic of our attitude towards technology. Uh, more than 70%, 65 to 70% of this building is recycled materials. 
uh, recycled from fly ash from power stations, uh, stone dust from mining quarries, um, the um, uh, industrial wastes of various types, and particularly uh, uh, construction and, and, and demolition waste, uh, including the whole building that existed there before was demolished and recycled into this building. Uh, it's known as one of the greenest buildings anywhere in the world because not only did it save about 60 to 70 percent virgin material, it also saved a similar amount of carbon uh, uh, dioxide emission and uh, water, both in the in the construction of it as well as in the operations. And so it's a, a really quite amazing uh, contribution. Now, DA does three different things, three broad areas of work. One is income generation. The second is clean and green environment. And the third is empowering communities. And each of these is done in two subsets. Uh, income generation comes from jobs or from creating enterprises, entrepreneurs. And we do a lot on both. Uh, clean and green environment comes from natural resource management, like soils, waters, forests, et cetera, which we do a lot of, and clean technology in the 21st century sense. Uh, and empowered communities is about uh, ensuring that the institutions needed to support uh, development are strong and that the basic needs of everyone are assured. Over the last 40 years, we've raised something of the order of $300 million, out of which about 40% was spent on R&D and on research. And although you cannot read this diagram very easily, it's meant to convey to you that every year we try to produce one or two marketable new technologies. They range from technologies for water, for construction, for, and I will show you a few examples in a minute. Uh, but the basic thing is that we are probably in, in the third world, um, the largest uh, innovator of what you might call frugal technologies, uh, technologies that are relevant to improving the lives of poor people in fragile ecosystems, ecozones. We've, we've done some remarkable work. There have been only four major cements in history, the Babylonian cement, the, the Roman cement, the Pozzolanic cement, and the Portland cement. And we've actually, with uh, a lot of support from the Swiss government, financial support with the Swiss government and, and with other partners, including the EPFL in Lausanne, we have developed a new fifth cement. It's low carbon and it's low, a very, very low in materials because we use mining wastes to make it. Uh, and as you can see the buildings in here, the middle top middle one is a part of the Swiss embassy because they supported this work and they wanted to show it. Um, uh, but all of this is demonstrating a very high tech major breakthrough in uh, innovation. Uh, this is a, another innovation, uh, very successful. We made more than 200 of these and we're now making them in large numbers in Africa. These are called vertical shaft brick kilns. These are burnt bricks. These are not unfired. They are fired bricks, but they've done in such a, an efficient way that about 50 to 55% less energy is needed for them. So we've made literally 500 of these check dams, which have a return on investment of the order of 500 to 1,000% a year. Uh, water filters, charcoal making, uh, cook stoves. Uh, these are, are one of our biggest technologies on the right, top right, which is a, a manual machine to make um, compressed earth. These are bricks that do not need firing and they save a huge amount of carbon emissions. And the next two are big ones, are mechanized ones doing the same thing. Uh, ferro-cement, uh, roofing materials that use virtually uh, one quarter the amount of cement and steel uh, that normal uh, concrete does. Uh, gasification, using uh, very high-tech gasifiers to uh, convert weeds and biomass into uh, into electricity at a, at a competitive rate. Of course, there's uh, things like solar energy and windmills and so on. And the biggest area for us is livelihood technologies. And two of them are here. One is uh, hand looms, very high-tech hand looms, which improve the earnings of a uh, weaver by 
a factor of four to 10, literally overnight after one day's worth of retraining and then recycled paper, recycled other products. These are the kinds of things that we sell. Here is uh, uh, the original way we carry water. Here is the way that um, women are now able to carry water. This is the way we do um, drinking water. This is the way we do our cooking. And uh, it has a huge impact on health and so on. These are my favorite technologies. As I say, we've built more than 500 of these. They're called check dams. They vary from 20 meters to about 120 meters. They're very cheap and their impact on, on the surrounding economy and ecology is incredible. This one, the, the, this one on the top right, for example, which cost us about $9,000 at the time we built it, uh, has a return, uh, has, a, uh, has an impact on the farmers around it uh, of literally uh, th thousands of dollars, um, sorry, tens of thousands of dollars uh, per year in, in income. But on top of that, it fills up the groundwater aquifers. And so the women don't have to walk far for uh, their drinking water. There's fish in the, in the river. This is a perennial. This, this used to be dry for three, four months in the year. You could walk across that river. Now it's perennial. And uh, it's good for recreation and fishing. And you've got wildlife coming back. And it's quite an amazing impact. And we make literally hundreds of these. So there's a uh, work we do on, um, I just told you about this. This is the gasifier, this is the weeds. This weed actually came in from Costa Rica about 150 years ago with coffee shipments, I suppose, but it's prolific. It's so prolific that in Hindi, we call it besharm, shameless. In Pakistan, near, in our neighboring country, they call it politician, I think for the same reason. Uh, but basically, it's a very, very powerful, uh, what would you say, fuel for making electricity. Um, <clears throat> so these are the kinds of things. We have a report card at the end of every year. We look at uh, what we've done for the environment, the green, for society, the blue, and for the economy, the, the orange. And these are um, very carefully monitored, third party verified. Um, you know, report cards, if you like, um, on uh, uh, how much income was generated, how much, how many uh, tons of uh, carbon was saved, how many trees were planted. Uh, we have about 30 of these um, parameters that we measure every year. This one is a cumulative one uh, for several years put together. Uh, and this is split into a more readable form, as you can see, this is uh, the economic one, Econ the income generated, how much was um, generated by income skill development and so on. This one is for society, institution strengthening and so, and so on. Uh, how many people were reached in this year? Some three quarters of a million people uh, got something from us, a skill, a job or whatever. And this is the environment one, waste utilized, green electricity, carbon saved, uh, hectares of land managed and so on. We work all over India. We sell our products uh, throughout because all the innovations are actually sold by a partner company of ours uh, and by anyone else. And so we actually have presence on, in every part of India, but we have personal projects, projects with people on our payroll in the blue zone and in the red zone is our sort of laboratory. That's our sustainability lab. Uh, where we test everything and, and and make it work. These are our footprints. We work in Anglophone Africa a lot, and now a little bit more in Francophone in the subcontinent and a little bit in Southeast Asia. But it's actually the big ellipse, the global thing that is uh, important because through the Club of Rome and IUCN and, and the UN and UNEP and so on, we have quite a lot of impact on global policies and and issues. So, Michael, that's basically what I wanted to tell you. Uh, th this was really great, uh, Ashok. But I have, uh, I think that we are really getting to the top of the hours and we still want to have uh, an opportunity for people to ask some questions. But I had two questions that I wanted to uh, raise with you. Uh, because of your tremendous experience throughout the history of the environmental movement, let's say, 
and your participation in all the great uh, uh, multilateral uh, development uh, agencies. Uh, we talked about, you, you mentioned the, the distinction between civil society and government and business and so forth. But when you look at the multilateral that are the main international organization to deal uh, ostensibly with those issues, how do you see their efficacy? Have they been effective? Are they doing enough? Are they structured in the right way to give us the, the correct, uh, not solutions, but they could help us get forward in the right way? This is the first question. I'll ask the second as well, because you may want to uh, weave them together in your answer. The other issue is the issue of scale and time. There's so many wonderful uh, items and, and initiatives around the world, certainly development alternatives, some of the work that we try to do at the lab. Uh, but when you look at the big engines, all the stuff that you talked about earlier, uh, the scale is minuscule. It's, it's really like a drop in the bucket. And at the same time, we are learning that time is of an essence, that we have 10 years or 20 years to turn things around. Uh, are we on the right way? Uh, do we have the right mechanisms to deal with this kind of uh, transformation? On your first question, I want to be very, very um, clear that I'm a great supporter of the multilateral uh, system and that there is um, important roles for the UN, the world, uh, maybe not the World Bank, but the UN and, and other agencies have a very strong role to play uh, for many things, for peace, for health, for technical issues, or communications, for all kinds of things, labor, et cetera. Uh, but the financing systems have uh, been, been overpowered by their own DNA, by the fact that they do not have the ability to deal with the kinds of issues that I've been talking about this evening. Uh, when you look around you, even you know Apple and Microsoft and others may have started in, in garages, but they had access to huge capital investments. As they grew, there was no way that these capital investments, uh, they could have grown without uh, large inputs of uh, financial and other uh, capital and, and huge in infrastructural uh, benefits of that society provides. I mean, Microsoft wouldn't be able to do anything if there weren't any communication um, networks, um, you know, and, and Facebook would be out of business. Uh, so these things uh, are very much tuned to the kinds of things that the big market can handle. The problems of the 80% who got left behind are invisible to these uh, financing systems. So if, if you were talking about speed and scale, Michael, you can forget it because nobody out there who has the ability to support it. I've spent the last five years trying to raise finance for a major scaling operation, really you know, ambitious uh, operation to scale up what we're doing to, to a much larger level. I couldn't even raise $1 million. You know, I mean, it's now that might be because of my incompetence. But I have to tell you that I, I had a lot of allies who were very much more competent on financing than I was. We still couldn't do it. And, and if you look around you, you get a lot of fobbing off. Yes, what an incredible idea, but it's not for us. Uh, uh, responses. And it's uh, been very tough. And the other part of it is, that every one of them wants you to go back to square one and show it as a pilot. You got to first prove again and again and again. And then when you, by that time, your three years have gone and they've gone on to something else. And, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the system is not geared to solving the problems we're talking, the, the, the problems whose symptoms we were talking about. Uh, and it's never going to be able to do, do, do that very well. The, on your, on your second, second point, uh, Michael, the, the issue that I think we've got to recognize is um, that we've, we've got to work uh, together and reinforce each other in ways that make it impossible for people to get out of this uh, vice, like grip that we have to have on them. And um, we're trying to find ways to do that maybe you know, the kind of forum that you set up here will bring together people who 
uh, find it interesting to to combine and and work together. Um, so uh, I, I'm sort of hopeful that things will start changing very soon. Yeah, well, I, I think uh, there's there's a, a, we could stay for another <laughs> lifetime on this, uh, but it, it is time probably to stop for everyone. Uh, so Ashok, thank you so much. It's really been uh, a, a great uh, session. Uh, I'm sure we'll get very nice response for this and the recording as Elizabeth was saying will be made available very soon. Uh, I think now that we sort of found each other again, I look forward to really staying in touch uh, more than, uh, more than uh, kind of saying it nicely, but there's so much we could do together. And I look forward to that uh, as well.